a machine for inflicting pain and humiliation on the other, the best and the worst that human beings are capable of. Kant argued that we were essentially committed to both of two ways of conceiving of our situation. From one perspective, he called it the perspective of the world of the senses. We are material creatures in a causal world. We're subject to the laws of nature, and our subjection can be studied objectively in the sciences. Kant thought that perspective had to be deterministic, seeing us as caught in the web of causal necessity. We, however, live in an age where science teaches that probability is a basic feature of reality, not just a reflection of our ignorance. But the perspective of the stances still supposes that sometimes what I do has an explanation from the outside that makes it inevitable. And Kant's deepest point was that this is not the only perspective we have. For sometimes, precisely because we are agents, we must adopt what he called the perspective of the world of the understanding. When I ask myself what to do, when I adopt the practical standpoint, I cannot wait to see what the laws of nature make happen. What shall I do is never the same question for the agent as what is going to happen through this material body. From the perspective of the understanding, as participators in what Kant called the intelligible world, Kant saw we have to see ourselves as in one sense free. Sometimes we must see ourselves as deliberating about which of many possible futures to bring about, even if there is a God's eye view from which the answer is already fixed. The old question of free will, whether construed as a worry about fate or about God's foreknowledge, has, after Kant, this new answer. Now, interp interpreting Kant's claims here is notoriously difficult, but it seems to me that there's something right in Kant's view. It begins with the simple insight that faced with a decision, you cannot wait to see what happens. Or rather, that if you do wait, that itself is just one of the things you're bound to believe you could have done. It's a deep philosophical question how to understand what happens when we causally determined agents, creatures, act. What is right in Kant's view is that when we act, there is always a sense in which we are taking ourselves to be free. What he also saw was that to take the perspective of an agent is to see your choices as responding to a different sort of necessity than that of causality. It's the necessity that Kant saw as the necessity of reason. When I make my choices, I must see myself as responding to reasons for acting. Freedom is not a matter of being undetermined. It's a matter of being determined not by causes, but by reasons. That's why we can't reinterpret the moral and other practical reasons that guide our choices as simply reflections of what we happen to want. To see your choices as flowing from bare desires is to have no real reasons at all. It's no surprise that the Latin word for the bare will, arbitrium, ends up as our word arbitrary. Kant's insight was that the free will is not a will ungoverned, but rather a will governed by reasons. And a will that is governed by reasons has to take those reasons as coming from outside itself. Well, Kant's dual standpoints inaugurate modern moral philosophy in the West. I'm arguing, this is not something that Kant would have agreed with, that honor is one of the calls made on us by reason. It's a call that depends on our recognition of the many standards presupposed by different registers of esteem, each of which gives us epistemic and pragmatic grounds for choice. We can, in the, matter, in the, matter, in the manner of the evolutionary psychologists, establish the origins of honor in primate wranglings over status. We can take the perspective of the world of the senses and assign honor fur and a tail. But it's always going to be a part, I think, of our perspective as agents. We are creatures equipped with many kinds of reasons. A normal person feels the pull of respect and the push of this respect as naturally as she grasps that pain is bad in others as it is in herself. And the authority of honor like the call of compassion, is as old as our species. In fact, it's older, I think. One aim of these lectures has been to trace a central thread in the rise of our moral modernity. In following the life of honor, we've seen our world take shape. The two hinge moments I've examined allow one to see a clash between modes of honor. In dueling, we see a pre-modern conception of honor as the redoubt of an exalted, or exalted class bumping up against a world in which honor was acquiring a broader class of claimants. 
the warrior's honour becoming the civility of Newman's gentleman. In the destruction of duelling, you actually hear the last gasp of old school honour throttled so that it doesn't end up in the wrong hands. We can borrow from Oscar Wilde again. Each class kills the thing it loves. What it cannot possess, it destroys. With anti-foot binding, the modernizing rhetoric was quite explicit. If China was to enter the modern world, it had to attend to the voices of scoffing of the modern world. The military and technological superiority of the West conferred on it a certain authority. But here, too, there is a clash between pre-modern honor, secured by the footbinding of one's daughters and wives, and the modernizer's honor. Something individual Chinese men and women insisted was lost in the transition. There are other cases I haven't had time to argue here, but let me mention in closing just one. In British abolition, British anti-slavery, the democratization of honor, the insistence that labor and the laborer have a claim to honor too, meant that the working classes, denied an official role in the parliamentary struggle, nevertheless could see their dignity in the dignity of the slaves. And there's a similar crossing over or chiasmus here too. The workers' emerging pride had first taken the form, treat me better than a slave, so the workers' dignity was first defined by its distance from the laboring African, but that was an unstable position. Once you talked about the honor of work, you ended up with the conclusion, treat no man as a slave. In all these instances, honor, the cement of social hierarchies, local and global, was reconfigured as hierarchies were reformed. And it was in these processes that a global moral modernity appeared. In adding, however, it is not clear how much was subtracted. Our modern standing armies have kept in place a world of military honor many of whose loyalties and sentiments I suspect Wellington would have recognized, as perhaps would even Homer's Achilles, or Shakespeare's Duke of Bourbon, who, realizing at Agincourt that the day is lost, cries out, you will recall, shame and eternal shame, nothing but shame, let's die in honor. I've been arguing that we live not after honor, but with new forms of honor. Perhaps, though, we must end by remembering in this age of never-ending warfare, that the older form remains. Thank you very much.